Now I would like to introduce Daniela Bueso, who will be presenting for us from Trees, Water, and People. Daniela, if you'd like to unmute yourself and begin your presentation. Great, thank you, Emily, and it's good to see everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with all of you, and then we can get started. Okay. All right, so just wanted to start us off. Um, so first off, this is the title of my presentation today. Um, I'm in representation of Trees, Water and People, which is a local nonprofit here in Fort Collins. Um, and then the sister arm organization of TWP Tours, which I was a, a big part of for the past three years. Um, and now I recently, uh, you know, got into the Central America program co-director position. So. We'll be talking about traveling with a purpose, uh, cross-cultural exchange and intentional travel. And, and before we begin, I wanted to give a brief uh, land acknowledgement here at TWP. We always do this out of respect to our ancestors, but also the communities that we work with. So I'm gonna show you a two minute uh, video in order to get us started. And then we will move on with the presentation. So bear with me for two minutes and please let me know if you guys can see or if you're having trouble with the video, um, we can get it going. Um, sorry, it's a little slow. understand the importance of emphasizing the relationship between people and land that native people recognize that everything has a spirit plants animals insects mountains and water native american identity is deeply tied to these and they are referenced and respected in our culture our creation stories healing ceremonies and celebrations please keep this in mind as I share the land acknowledgement with you. So we acknowledge and respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. Thank you. All right, so thank you all for uh, listening to that land acknowledgement as it is very important to us here at TWP. Um, so with that, I will continue on with the presentation and let me get a better view here. Okay, so first and foremost, I want to give you guys kind of an outline of what we'll be talking about today. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of what TDBP Tours is, and then I'll kind of describe the two uh, programs, the two type of programs that we have uh, for TWP and how you can travel for each of those countries because our programs because they differ quite a bit. Um, not only in context, but also partners and projects that you can see. And then at the end, we can talk about next steps and what the tourism industry is looking like and how it's affecting us um, as an organization. So let me keep going. Okay, great. So for those of you that don't know about TWP, we are a nonprofit based here in Colorado, Fort Collins. Uh, we've been active since 1998. Uh, so we're about hitting our 25th year anniversary, which is really exciting. And this is basically our mission statement. Um, the goal of TWP is to improve the lives of communities to help protect, conserve, and manage their natural resources on which their long term uh, well being depends. We believe in the people having the autonomy and the right. Um, and the resources available to protect not only themselves, but also the territories that they have been 
mostly displaced from. And now that they're part of the land again, we wanna give them that opportunity to be the owners of their resources. So with that background, um, TWP, Trees, Water and People is a, is a nonprofit. And then stemming from the nonprofit, we created this small LLC called TWP Tours. Uh, which was back in 2017. So it's, it's brand new, it's, it's a little young baby. Um, but the reason why we created TWP Tours was because a lot of the donors that used to donate to Trees, Water, and People were really interested in seeing, you know, what was going on on the ground, how were these partners being affected, what was the impact. And so we decided to create this small um, tourism company to be able to bring donors to the countries where we worked and kind of see the relationships and the projects firsthand. So we created a, a small mission for our uh, LLC, and that's basically to take these people to off the beaten path to see these projects firsthand. Uh, and not only that, but meet community leaders, meet partners, meet local staff. Um, and we have three kind of pillars or for our philosophy, and it's always patronizing local business, so supporting local communities, whether that be through lodging or food, um, and encouraging that sustainable choice model um, as, as an environmental nonprofit. And then also, you know, the, the fact that we support local families and communities, sometimes through arts and crafts, sometimes through, you know, experiences, but also if they have availability to host a group um, where they are, we usually, you know, provide that incentive to always pay back to the community, stay with the community and, and engage. So, so that's kind of our, our mission and philosophy for tours. And this creates a beautiful opportunity for not only our donors, um, just, just for you to keep in mind, these are tours that are open to anyone, anyone in the public. It could be students, it could be high school, college, it could be anyone random that's interested in, in trees, water, and people. This is an important part of, of our tours because it creates this cultural and knowledge exchange that not a lot of people get uh, with a regular tour or if you're on vacation, right? So we try to create these very unique itineraries in the communities where we work. So you can have amazing food and exchange language, meet the partners, meet other donors, meet other people of similar interests. Um, and, you know, get to meet the people face to face. Uh, some of the people that support us along the way always are excited to see where their money is going towards, but also kind of the impact, right? What is that aftermath um, of these projects and how is it affecting local communities in a good way. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to adapt certain projects, but people get to see firsthand how trees, water, and people is operating on the ground. Um, and, you know, we also do fun stuff. We do ecotourism um, activities like hiking, uh, boat rides, visiting dif uh, different national parks, doing some cultural activities, um, going to protected areas and seeing some biodiversity. So it's not all fully focused on TWP. I think probably 80% is focused on trees, water, and people projects. And then the other 20% would be kind of a extracurricular um, ecotourism opportunity. And then most importantly, especially for a lot of the youth groups or student groups that we've taken out on trips is that opportunity to learn about the history and some of the challenges and opportunities that these communities have gone through uh, through the years, particularly in Central America, I feel like when you get into the context of what this community has been through, uh, you know, from colonization to displacement to where they are now, a lot of people kind of connect the dots of um, why we're doing why we're do what we're doing and why it's important work, right, and why we are so committed to these communities. So that's, that's kind of the essence of, of these trips um, is to get that full immersion. And so, of course, there are a couple of strengths within these programs and these tours. You know, it puts us on the map. It puts kind of the accomplishments and the good stories that we've created along the years so that people can see them. Um, it allows people to interact, handshake with a few folks that they've met along the way. Um, and, you know, they, they get to see it for themselves, right? That's kind of what we want these um, tours to offer is for you to see it face to face. Um, and a lot of these require, you know, knowledge exchanges, capacity building, sharing language and photos. Um, and then it builds donor engagement, right? So a lot of our donors, when they come back from a tour, they want to keep giving more or they, or they understand the context a little bit better. So you keep them kind of engaged in our mission, which is always our goal. Um, and cultural education, you know, that's, that's been going on um, since the get-go and every tour we adapt and every tour is different, uh, but it, it allows us to work as a team um, and really get 
give people the best experience that we can possibly get them. So th those are some of the strengths that have been going on through the years. And of course, there are challenges and limits, as, uh, particularly for a small LLC like TWP Tours, you know, recruitment um, is sometimes really tough, especially because a lot of the locations that I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes are, are not like your high touristy destinations, right? These are communities that are like deep in like hidden communities or, you know, they're not heard about. So recruiting people to come with us is usually um, a, a, a limit or a challenge. And also some of these students, for example, younger generations that can't afford a trip like this um, is also a, a, a challenge for recruitment. But we are trying to widen our network is still kind of limiting, especially now with the pandemic and the prices and inflation. So we've kind of taken a step back um, with the tours at the moment, but we'll talk about that at the end. Um, and of course, as most of you have seen and heard, climate change and environmental challenges, particularly in Central America, have really taken a, a toll on, on the communities where we work. And so access to roads is impossible. Um, communities are trying to rebuild from the hurricane seasons. Um, so, so right now, I, I think the momentum of the trips has slowed down because of all of these challenges with climate change, especially hurricane season in, in Central America. Um, and then again, more involvement from other local stakeholders and collaborators. It's always hard to pinpoint uh, some people to visit. Um, sometimes people cancel last minute. Um, so always come across these challenges, right? And I think a really, really important, I guess it's a misconception of, you know, our tours are not service tours. So a lot of times you get people from various groups that say, hey, I want to go and like, you know, do service projects and give back to the community. But the whole purpose of TWP tours is more of a connection, is more of a let's go and listen, let's let's learn about those their story and their and their challenges. And if they have a project that they want to work with us hand in hand, then that's fine, right? It has to be created and asked for by the community. It can't be something where we come in and fix the problems or give them things, material things, right? So that's kind of our mentality as a tour company is more of listeners um, than, than doers, right? Than, than having to go in and, and fix things. So that's kind of a misconception that some people usually ask or, or want to do. Um, so we try to be really cautious about this. Um, and again, lack of activities and projects, this sometimes happens with partners. Um, when they're in slow season, they don't have a lot going on. So it usually becomes a challenge for us to show different projects or kind of impact because some of these impacts come, you know, years, years after the project has started. So just wanted to mention some of those as, you know, the, the tourism company is never perfect and it fluctuates quite a bit, um, especially with a pandemic. But needless to say, these are some, um, let me see over here. So these are for the Central America program within Trees, Water and People. These are the four countries where we are focused right now. Um, so this is any of these countries you can travel to, right? With TWP tours. Um, unfortunately, Nicaragua, we've kind of paused for, for you know, taking a healthy pause um, because of the political situation. And we're always cautious about you know, contacting our partners, making sure uh, things are safe, um, the country's in a good place to have visitors and also communities are feeling not only empowered, but also okay with having visitors, right? We always wanna check in with our partners. And so these are kind of the, the main focuses of the program um, within the Central America team. So we do all of these themes are in each of the countries. Some countries have, have all of these and some countries have just a few. So these are just like a few examples of what we have done uh, with our tours um, that kind of encompass <laughs> the entire program. Um, so yeah, from tree nurseries to water catchment systems to agroforestry and sustainable agriculture, like I mentioned, forest conservation, doing some hikes, bird watching, uh, cross-cultural exchange is probably the biggest win. Um, and then improved cookstoves, which is one of our pilot or our flag, flagship projects for, for TWP that has been a hit since the get-go. So those are some that you can see in Central America. And like I said, these are the locations and these are some of the partners um, and activities that we have done in, in past tours where we get to go to El Salvador. This is a photo of our partners 
our tree nursery manager and a young professional from El Salvador showing us around their farm. Um, you know, we get to see eco technologies, protected area management in El Salvador, uh, the tree nursery, sometimes you get to plant trees, which again, it's not a, a forced activity, but rather a community activity that we get to do with the community. Um, and in Guatemala, you know, we get to visit our uh, amazing partner, Utsche, which we've been working with since 2012. Um, and this is a really good, good partner to visit because they have so much going on. So you can see everything from gardens to sustainable family agriculture, to gender equity, to youth, to forest conservation. So they really have a, a big pot um, of projects that they have. And so Guatemala is always a, a popular tour. Um, and Honduras is actually getting a lot of traction recently. Uh, we've had a few new partners, um, Coyas being one of them. This is a reserve uh, right outside of Tegucigalpa, the, the capital city of Honduras. And they're um, an old indigenous community that is trying to protect this biological reserve um, from the encroachment of inhabitants that are coming from the uh, rural areas into the city. And so they're trying to protect this beautiful reserve and they've created trails and communication pieces and they have birds and they've identified certain species. So they're, they're beginning to get a lot of tourism traction uh, within their community. And then Adesa and Maestros Fogoneros are kind of the, the clean cook stove partners. So they're the ones that take us around the houses and show us the impact of a clean cook stove, the benefits, the health benefits and environmental benefits. So there's, again, a variety of different uh, themes uh, per country. And then Nicaragua, we haven't traveled to since 2017. Um, but luckily we have had um, other good areas, here we go, where we have traveled to, um, which we call custom tours. Oops, sorry, this is going ahead of, of me. <laughs> here we go. Okay, so these are kind of our custom tours. So we call these custom because these are not particularly countries where TWP operates, but they are high, um, high demand places where people want to travel to. So TWP Tours has done three locations outside of our work sphere, uh, to Cuba, Colombia, and Mexico. So these are, again, kind of maintaining TWP Tours alive. And if people were to say, hey, we want, you we want to hire you guys as, as a third party to take us to this country, uh, we usually provide that service as well because we, we have some knowledge in, in these three countries. Um, we recently had one in, uh, this is pre-pandemic, we had a whale watching tour in Baja, California, and we were trying to scout Mexico as a potential new partner for trees, water, and people. So this also gives us a, a good opportunity to scout new countries where we potentially want to work um, in the future, right? Because this is a good opportunity to not only see local organizations and what they're doing, but just trying to grow the program as a whole. So, so TBD, um, but these are three great areas to visit. And then now I'm gonna go into the indigenous lands tours, which again are, are very different from Central America, but kind of have the same mission and goals, right? So the vision of the ILP program is, you know, supporting community led regenerative natural resource projects to improve economic, social and cultural lively ways of indigenous people in the US, right? And they have these three uh, themes uh, for their philosophy is to restore the land um, that has been affected by natural resources, uh, promote the stewardship of indigenous people towards a more sustainable life, and then value the transmission of traditional knowledge. This is probably one of our favorites. Favorite part of these tours is the amount of knowledge and culture and language that these um, indigenous communities have and that you can see um, in a tour. So the, the countries or the organizations that we work with currently, there are a few in South Dakota. So we have Red Cloud Renewable Energy. He was our first uh, partner in South Dakota. Uh, now we're trying to migrate more to New Mexico. We have a tri public coalition down there uh, with three communities bordering the Rio Grande. Um, we started with the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe here in Southwest Colorado. They've been doing amazing work, um, getting brand new grants and you know, doing other collaborations with the Nature Conservancy, the Colorado State Forest Nursery, um, and the East Hemis Landscape Future, uh, working on watershed uh, restoration projects, reforestation projects. So these are some of the partners that the ILP program is working with. And so when you go on, on tours for ILP, these are kind of the themes. These are the, the projects that you can see, right, or the focuses. So 
big, big focus on reforestation efforts, uh, particularly in uh, places where there have been fires um, or drought or sometimes flooding. South Dakota had a big flood back in 20, I believe it was 2018 or 2019. Um, we talk about healthy rangelands, we talk about food security, how to connect um, indigenous people back to their native foods, their culture, um, and then energy efficiency. That's kind of how we started in South Dakota was working with um, um, Henry Redcloud with solar energy and renewable energy. So how can we provide these communities with more sustainable, efficient energy sources that they themselves can rely on and they can learn about um, and basically implement in their communities, right? So these are kind of the four main focuses for their program. And so if you take a look here, the, the two locations where we've traveled so far have been South Dakota and New Mexico. Uh, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe is still pending. We're, we're just now starting those relationships. And so for us at TWP, um, we require some time or want to take our time to build those relationships and that transparency to then be able to bring in people to the communities, right? And kind of build that autonomy for them to host, right? Because it is a big en endeavor. So yeah, South Dakota is a big hit, especially for student groups. We've taken around uh, school, school groups from Lansing Catholic High School. We've taken a, a group from Steamboat High School. We've taken recently a, a group from CSU Trio Upward Bound Program. So South Dakota is a great, great place for students to go and see. It's close by, it's driving distance. It's a little bit cheaper than traveling to Central America. So they get to visit, you know, some of these partners, as you can see here, the Red Color Renewable Energy Center, uh, the Cheyenne River Youth Project, and some other local businesses, so, such as the Thunder Valley CDC, which provides housing, um, garden workshops, and basically autonomy to indigenous communities in South Dakota. And then New Mexico has been a brand new one. Uh, we've actually only piloted New Mexico with actual uh, adults, not student groups. We've, we've actually taken our board to New Mexico and we've taken some private groups from Boston and other areas through contacts that we've had through the years. And so these are kind of the two locations that we're focusing on. And like I said before, South Dakota is probably the ultimate favorite for the youth. Um, they get fully immersed in the Lakota culture and the people. They learn about different projects. They actually do some hands-on projects that our partners actually ask for, right? And then the, the people that we visit in South Dakota are kind of volunteer-led organizations. So that's that's something that we offer is, hey, these kids are ready to work, but also they want to learn about their cult, your culture, your mission, your, your organization. So they learn everything from gardening to listening to drum groups and storytellers, you know, doing beadwork um, to learning about sustainable energy and um, projects like the Henry Red Cloud. So this is probably a, a ultimate favorite for youth. And then New Mexico, like I said, it's more of that, um, private uh, adult uh, tour, you could say. We do want to open it up to students in the future. We did take one student group back in 2021 as a pilot and it went well, but that was in the you know chaos of the pandemic. There were still no vaccines available. And so there was a, a little bit of a, it was more of a hectic trip um, with a big group of students. So we decided to make these tours a little bit smaller within the pandemic uh, to be able to handle all of the logistics that goes along with that. So this particular tour is really good for food, culture, history. Um, the communities in, in New Mexico are amazing from Santa Fe to the different pueblos. Um, and yeah, a lot of these, our, our director James is actually from New Mexico. So he also provides a lot of that background and culture and history to these tours. So again, we also wanna encourage strengthening local economies um, by doing you know, private events um, owned by indigenous and Hispanic people in New Mexico, which is, which is great. And so finally to close off, um, just wanted to leave some, some room for questions and discussion, you know, along the way, since the pandemic hit, um, definitely TWP tours has slowed down. There was two years from 2020 to 2021, except for that one pilot tour to New Mexico that we had to stop all operations. Um, and so this has, taught us a lot along the way um, that, you know, tourism is never sustainable. It, it, it goes like the stock market, it goes up and down, up and down, but it kind of keeps going up um, at the moment with 
the high prices of the economy, the interest rates, the gas prices, uh, tourism has taken a hit. And so we have recognized that as an organization and we say, okay, now instead of pitching tours every year and doing this nonstop, we should just rely on requests, right? Or taking private groups um, like family and friends or corporate partners or donors that call us and say, hey, we're ready to travel. Can you organize a trip for us? Um, calling it on-demand tours <laughs> because before we used to struggle pre-pandemic again with the recruitment um, but now when you add all these layers to it, it it makes it a little bit more difficult so we are we are still active however we we do it by request right so this is kind of the new strategy we've taken to kind of build that donor engagement um, we want to grow our youth programs a lot more a lot of these schools come back to us every year and say, hey, we want to go back to South Dakota or we want to try New Mexico. So again, we're always open. We're always available. We're always willing to make a new tour, especially for people that have traveled with us to the past, in the past. Um, and it also allows us to make new partnerships, right? And build our education and exposure of our work. So, so it is to say that we, we're trying our hardest to keep it alive and it is alive. Uh, but at the moment, it as you all know, it has a, been a healthy pause, um, but we're, we're available, we're adaptive, and we're, we're learning. And I just kind of wanted to throw this out there, but we are actually have a potential opportunity at TWP coming up next year, for those of you who are interested in a grants prospecting intern uh, that can help our grant manager, Helen Goody, kind of look for prospecting grants, um, not related to tours, but in general for trees, water, and people as a whole. Um, this is probably, you know, the hardest part of the nonprofit world is the, the philanthropy, right, and the fundraising, as you all know. So I, I kind of wanted to throw this out there now, um, but you could also email me personally if you have any questions or want to keep the conversation going. Uh, we do want to offer this opportunity for students who are on the call. Um, it is unfortunately unpaid, <laughs> but you do get a lot of exposure and you do learn a lot uh, from the nonprofit world. So with that, I'm just going to thank you all for your attention. I know that was kind of a fast presentation, but I uh, here's my email. Here's our phone number and our address. Feel free to stop by any time with questions. Um, feel free to email me directly or anyone at our office. And I just want to thank you again for the opportunity. And I'm going to open it now to some questions. So I'm going to stop sharing over here. Greetings, Daniela. Am I? I think I'm coming through. I, I think my face just froze briefly, but um, I love hearing all the amazing things that you all are doing over there and uh, what you're involved in. I, I think there might be a few questions coming up here, um, or at least some comments anyway. Um, I, I, you probably see these questions as well. So let's just start with a question from Ro, I'm guessing, R O who says, thank you, Daniela, for the interesting presentation. I was wondering if you intend to include other indigenous groups, for example, from Canada, Australia, et cetera. That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question, Ro. Um, unfortunately, because our team is so small, we have a staff of 12. Uh, the ILP program actually currently has two staff. Um, one is actually based in Ute Mountain Ute, and then James, our director, is based here in Colorado. But I mean, that's the dream, right? If, if we were able to get more funding, if we were able to grow our team, I mean, the, the, the world is our oyster. Um, we would love to in the future, but because of the capacity that we have right now, I think it would be, it would take us a few years to, to get, especially in a new, you know, new places like that. But I mean, it, it, who knows? We, we've been active for 25 years and who knows what the next 25 will bring, but that's a great question. Yeah, and I, I think kind of piggybacking off of that question, one question that I had was you mentioned in your presentation how you're considering right expansion, working with um, indigenous groups here in the US. Um, you've already been developing some of those partnerships. You mentioned the Ute Mountain Ute um, peoples in Southwest Colorado and that um, you know, you're exploring possibilities of partnership, right? And what that might look like. Um, even with like tourism opportunities, kind of bringing visitors there. Um, I, I heard a recent presentation from Ernest House Jr. And maybe maybe you've interacted with him a little bit. He, um, you know, has done a lot of work with uh, helping 
let's say, uh, uh, direct and talk about policy involving indigenous groups with the U.S. Congress and governor, lieutenant governor of Colorado and like state government here. Um, and so it, it, he actually mentioned in his presentation how he's, he's wanting to invite and the Ute Mountain Ute peoples are wanting to invite and try to engage more visitors and have tourism kind of develop there. They're, they're located just north of uh, what is it? The Mesa Verde National Park area is what what I understand from from his talk. And so I was wondering if you could, what does that process look like in terms of trees, water, people connecting with those peoples there, the Ute Mountain Ute peoples, Southwest Colorado, and and where's the current conversation? Just curious. Oh, no, that's an excellent question, and I, and I wish James was here because he runs the program, and also our, our new hire, um, Hannah Ertle, who actually lives in the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. Um, hmm. Yeah, those those relationships, I mean, they started, I think, strongly about two years ago, um, where our previous uh, co-worker, Emily, started building those relationships, and we actually got a grant, a uh, big grant, to work in Ute Mountain Ute. Um, to recover some of those ancestral foods, shrubs, and kind of doing some watershed restoration projects within the tribe. Hmm. Um, and then that kind of migrated into a partnership with TWP. And now we're just, like I mentioned, just starting to build that relationship with the tribe. And, you know, uh, I, I hate to say this, but sometimes a lot of these communities are, are kind of, and, and in Central America too, they, they're, they're very cautious of these new groups or, or people coming into their community and, and bringing stuff to the table when we've seen the past of these indigenous communities, right? And, and what has happened to their lives and their land and their resources. So I just wanna reiterate that these relationships take so much time and this trust building is essential for TWP to, to have a good impact, right? And, and impact takes years. <laughs> and so, so yeah, I mean, we that's why we haven't traveled to Ute Mountain Ute because because we want to establish that foundation with the tribe and kind of get the people motivated, have some sort of projects that people can actually go see, right? And, and not overwhelm them or, or if they have so much going on right now that there's no way that even us as a staff, as a big group of staff can go there and, and ask questions. And, and mm -hmm. so it's always a, a tricky situation and it takes some time, but we, <clears throat> like I said, it's on the map. People have asked about you, Mount you. It's going to be it's going to be a future tour for sure. I know it, um, but we don't know when we don't know when that, you know, transparency and, and, and open door is available for a big group to come down. But yeah, we always want to be cautious and respectful of our partners and, and the tribes and, and respect their land and, and their time and, and, pa and patience with us. Uh, so yeah, I wish James was here. I know they've, they've built that relationship um, a while back and now it's growing a lot more because of the grants that, that they just got. And having Hannah there as a, an official Trees Water and People employee kind of gives us more of that face-to-face -face, um, interaction that the tribe usually didn't have. So hmm. uh, she was just hired this year. And so we are, we're just kind of waiting for that to kind of take flight. Um, and then, you know, start knocking on doors and, and asking for opportunities. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it definitely uh, I you, has been I a- tell you what, I mean, taking that approach as opposed to the alternative, which is what? Just showing up at their door and starting to bring visitors in or something? I mean, right. <laughs> yeah, what you're doing, I, I couldn't commend you all enough in, in, in that approach of just patience and developing relationships. And um, it ties to, I think, Katie Boucher, who's with EOVA. I'm not sure what that stands for, but um, their comment about um, just appreciating your honesty, transparency, the pivoting uh, that has taken place, I guess, with trees, water, people in general. Um, and Katie actually asked a question I'll bring up saying, my, apologize, my apologies if you mentioned this at the beginning, but what initially drew trees, water, people to working with indigenous groups in Central America versus other countries? And that kind of ties in back to the first question that we brought up with you here. But. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question because, um, so TWP was actually founded by two former Peace Corps volunteers that did their service in Guatemala. And they saw a lot of deforestation in the area. And so when they came back to the US, they're like, oh my gosh, these, we need to help, you know, we need to, what can we do? Uh, they created this nonprofit. And as most of you know, <laughs> the majority of the environmental degradation in Central America happens inside indigenous communities, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of these 
uh, territories where families have been displaced by civil war. They migrated to Mexico and after X amount of years, they come back to their land. It's on arable land, it's not farmable, it's not, they don't have water, access to water. So of course, a lot of the politics and I, get, I would say corruption or misuse of natural resources happens within these communities that don't have, let's say, a so-called title to mm -hmm. their land. And so this is why we started working with these communities is because they had no, no one defending their territory. They had no one to say, hey, no, this is protected indigenous land. <laughs> And a lot of these communities have agrarian debt. They owe money to the government for the land that they had years back, right? So again, it comes back to that colonial history that a lot of these indigenous communities are still fighting for. Um, and so of course, the majority of the degradation was happening inside these communities. And that's when TABP said, okay, how can we slowly get into these communities and listen and learn and, and get, you know, a, a listen to to their needs like what's happening what's the background what's the title progress what what's happening with the land and so it is a tricky uh place to be in right because these are vulnerable communities and these are communities that are, have struggled through the years and so and that goes also here for our, our program in the u.s right i mean these are <laughs> as, no, now, right? <laughs> yeah so so i guess yeah. our goal is to also you know work with the unrepresented underserved mm -hmm. communities, which are usually indigenous. And so let's yeah. change that narrative. Let's give them back their land. Let's give them back their resources. Let's give them the autonomy to run the show. Um, and that's what we're there for. We're kind of that bridge uh, that we're facilitators. We're not telling anyone what to do. We're there to offer a hand and, and you know, help them with seed resources, we call them, right? And so, right. Don't know if that answers your question for absolutely Danielle. I mean, and, and the shift back into kind of focusing on, on groups here at home in the US, anyways. Um, interesting in that, you know, I just heard from a Lakota elder recently as well, talking about her experiences during the winter months in South Dakota, you know, their lands. They they refer to the winter as the killing months because some of their housing is it's just exceptionally cold and people you know lack of of access to energy sources for and and uh basic um infrastructure what I'm, what's the word i'm looking for in the walls right uh you know to keep things warmer you know it's 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 a very um meaningful shift i think to to bring it back home as well I want to point out, Katie mentioned that EOVA stands for Eastern Oregon Visitors Association. Oh, okay. um, uh, chiming in from Oregon there. Um, yeah. We do have about you know ten minutes more or so uh, to answer a few more questions, and there are, there's a lot of you know uh, commentary coming in here, which I believe you can look at. I'll I'll bring up this question from Atsero Milbur Milburga. We'll we'll go with that. Um, welcome, Atsero, who says. Could you say that one of your challenges in working with indigenous peoples is a linguistic uh, and or cultural barrier? Uh, is that Does that arise frequently, both abroad and at home? You know, luckily uh, our Central America indigenous communities are bilingual. So they speak their, their original native language and they speak Spanish. So luckily, you know, myself included and, and the co-director Valentina who lives in Guatemala, we're both fluent in Spanish. We're both uh, Latinas. So, in that realm, it helps. Um, there have been definitely some cultural differences. I mean, they're, they're, they have different customs and food and, and dances that you learn about. Mm. Um, it's a very pleasant surprise, but, but no, luckily the majority of these indigenous communities have, are bilingual and some that don't have the majority of the leaders um, uh, are bilingual because of the fact that a lot of the fighting that they do for their agrarian debt and all of that, they have to speak in Spanish to the government officials. They have to, basically learn a new language, right? And here in the US, luckily, uh, so James is actually from New Mexico. So he speaks his language with his people. Um, is that so James Calabasas? Yeah, James Calabasa. James Calabasa. Luckily, <laughs> our, our staff is really well equipped with the language barrier so far. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't come across any issues like that. We, we have translators. We are translators as tour guides. Um, so yeah, luckily no, no problems there yet, but we have heard different languages like mom, um, which is a Mayan dialect of, um, indigenous peoples and we, we hear it <laughs> and then it gets translated to us and then we translate back to, 
to the travelers. So, wow. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, that's uh, that is interesting. Um, Dan Foster asks, with regard to cultural tours, what type of reluctance are you experiencing with tribal protection of traditional uh, cultural knowledge? Was there a lot of like you know protective mindsets with the people among the people you're working with? Not again. I think because they trust in TWP and we've had kind of that relationship built. A lot of these communities are excited to share their mm -hmm. culture and their language and their their migration stories. And so, so no. And definitely there are there are parts or parts of the story that they leave behind. I mean, it's not everything is is told during these tours. Um, but again, we're always very respectful to to not ask those questions if if you know if they don't want to. And particularly here, I think it, it in Central America it doesn't happen that much. But I would say the times we've taken student groups to uh, indigenous communities here in the U.S., sometimes there are questions that come across that sometimes make people uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're very very cautious prior to the trip to say, hey, if you have a question. Uh, you know, make sure you can't, you ask me or James first or your adult supervisor to make sure that question is appropriate, right? <laughs> because, right, right. yeah, I mean, um, a lot of the history here in the U.S. is very untold in these Native communities. And so students coming in with the history background that they have from school is very different from on the ground, right? And so we're very careful with the way we phrase a question or how we open up the floor to questions. Uh, we always ask our partners, like, hey, are you uncomfortable with, you know, talking to the group if you are please don't worry about it you know so we try to be that facilitator between um the groups and the tribes to to not make that uncomfortable or not be inappropriate but right so far no i think the hardest ones have been the ones with students because you know they they are young they, they are trying to be curious uh and sometimes those questions can come across as as difficult right right um, I think of kind of recapturing narratives, you know, and the, and the voices of the indigenous groups. We heard from uh, yesterday um, the co-directors of Tourism Reset, uh, where they were talking about the Black travel narrative. Um, and Reset stands for Race, Ethnic, Ethnicity, Social Equity, and Tourism. Um, so that was interesting, but but certainly, yeah, being mindful of those those nuances and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. sensitive about the questions that we ask so all right um i think you mentioned it, you are starting to consider visits or, or partnerships with mexico and did you potentially this That's is Cooper asking that question <laughs> yeah potentially um mexico has been on the map for a few years um for us uh we are scouting or talking to partners in mexico particularly in oaxaca um but we haven't you know we it's it's a big project it's a big endeavor en endeavor so we that's the plan for next year but mm -hmm. we haven't made any official connections yet but potentially hopefully is there is there a potential trip there towards the beginning of next year is it towards the end do you know we had planned we might have a oaxaca tour in march of next year yeah. uh we still have to decide that as a team because since i just migrated from I basically just left TWP Tours to become the co-director of the Central America program. So we kind of have to figure out uh, who will take care of the tour, who will lead the tour. We usually hire local guides. And so it is on the map. However, it's not confirmed. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it happens, that will be a great opportunity to do scouting and visit partners, talk to different people. So yeah, hopefully it happens. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a great opportunity. Um, all right, Atsero asks another uh, question here. Is there any relationship between cross-cultural awareness and the tourist experience? Um, and I think, you know, for the sake of time, maybe we'll, we'll end with that question. I know Julia has a few additional comments here about Spanish lessons and some other things that we'll mention before closing. But so yeah, as a final question, your thoughts on the relationship between cross-cultural awareness and the tourist experience? I think it's really good. I think, um, you know, the the people that travel to these communities really come back with a full um, open mind <laughs> about culture, about realities of these different countries, about the background and the history of these indigenous communities. And they, and they come back really motivated and, and open-minded, right, to what's happening outside of our bubble <laughs> in the U.S. Right. And so I think the experience, particularly for the, for the, person that travels with us is eye-opening 
and even for our partners, they they um, and the communities we visit, they love you know to show off their their land and their projects and learn from us and ask questions and and you know show pictures of where you live and so yeah it is a it is a beautiful experience but um hopefully the goal after we come back is that these people come back with motivation to support this type of work whether it's with us or other organizations that are doing the same work um mm -hmm. to help these communities that are most vulnerable yeah that's that's great well Danielle, it's great to see you. Uh, I know you're like right down the street here, actually. I believe, uh, you know, being online, we could be anywhere in the world right now, I guess. But um, so, yes, uh, many thanks to you for joining us and giving us the overview, addressing these, these questions. Um, if anyone listening has any other thoughts, questions, wants to reach out, please feel free to contact Danielle here through the, the Whova app, or there's that Q&A option still available um here 